So hello everyone. Um, today I want to talk about two main topics. Uh, the first one is no SQL. The second one is domain-driven design. And then I want to bring those two concepts together and explain how I think they can en enhance your applications and make them better. Uh, so there's this story about building the Tower of Babel. Uh, in, in this story, in the beginning, uh, they all spoke the same language. Uh, and they built a really impressive tower. Like, look at this tower. It's really impressive. But um, they got really braggy because if people build something very impressive, they will get braggy. So uh, they were punished and the language was taken away. And then the tower never got finished. So um, in our projects, we uh, um, often st don't start with the same language. We maybe start with the same human language, so even if not all the people involved in the project have the same native tongue. They will probably switch to English or something. But we all speak a diff different jargon. So you may have someone in your uh, project who's like dealing with databases, for example. Then this person uses words like tables, for example. Uh, and then you have a programmer. And she will probably talk about classes and about variables and stuff like that. Uh, and even those two worlds are not very close together. Um, and then we have a do domain expert. And in our example, because space is awesome, we uh, choose space shuttles and astronauts. So this person really knows a lot about space shuttles and astronauts. So this person, if someone tells them there are tables g going on, then this person probably doesn't know what this means, even though they are very familiar with the application. So, Eric Evans came up with this idea of domain-driven design. So he wrote a really good book about it. Um, and he says that his main goal is that everyone finds an ubiquitous language. That means that this language is understood by every single person involved in the project, no matter what their role is. If they are a, a programmer, a domain expert, or um, yeah, a database person. In this language, in a lot of projects, I see that people try to evolve this language from the programming stuff. But uh, Eric Evans suggests that you take the domain language because this is the problem you are trying to solve. And therefore, it should be at the core of your discussions. Uh, so um, domain-driven design has two uh, building blocks it is built on. So without them, you can't do it. The first one is iterative development. I won't talk about that too much because most of us know that and probably do that. If you have questions about that, come to me later. Um, so I will skip over that. Uh, the other uh, important thing is that you have a close relationship between your developers and your domain experts. Because if you want to develop a, a language that everyone understands, then you have to talk to each other. If you don't talk to each other, then um, you can't develop a language. So uh, hi, my name is Lucas. I don't come from a place with the, such beautiful beaches. I come from a cold place called Germany. Uh, and uh, in particular, I come from a city you know as Cologne. Uh, and there is a big myth going on about German people and about our language, that our language is a, like built from very long words. And actually, that's a lie. So Köln is how we call uh, Cologne in Germany. And as you see, it's much shorter than Cologne. So this is an obvious lie. Um, if you take one thing away from this talk, please let it be this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as a second example, in the background you see this quite impress pr impressive church. Uh, and in uh, German it's called a dome, and in English it's called a cathedral. So you see this is all a big lie. But I don't want to lie to you, so this bridge you see on the right side is the Hohenzollernbrücke. <laughs> so, Maybe there's some truth in that. Uh, okay, so uh, I work for a company called ArangoDB GmbH, uh, which means like ArangoDB Inc. maybe. Um, so we work on something called ArangoDB, and ArangoDB is a NoSQL database, which is open source, it's on GitHub, um, and it's a lot of fun working on an open source project for money. Um, so. One question that this raises is, what is NoSQL? And I think a lot of people understand different things when they hear the word NoSQL. So I want to, yeah, first confuse you a little bit more and then try to uh, explain what I think NoSQL means. 
So if you look at this, there is something called SQL. And then everything that's not SQL is obviously no SQL, right? So uh, if you have a chair, a chair is definitely no SQL. Um, maybe it can even scale. So, um, and people try to confuse you even more. So they say the no doesn't mean no because it would be too obvious. So it means now not only. So this makes it even more confusing because now even parts of this SQL thing are part of, SQL, of not no SQL. So yeah, nobody really knows what is going on anymore. But let's try to analyze what, what this means. So what is no SQL? It's not SQL, obviously. Like this is probably the only thing we can say about it and this is not even true anymore. Um, so the question is what is SQL? And SQL is a relational algebra. And this raises the question, what is a relational algebra? And it's obviously an algebra on relations. Uh, so uh, what, what is a relation? So um, this is a relation. Um, it's a set of tuples. So in this case, we have two tuples. One is Alice, some date, and a number. And the other one is Bob, uh, some date, and a number. Uh, and we can't really say what this means, but because what is this number at the end? This second one could be a birth date, it could be anything, um, but what is this number? We don't know. So we came up with a quite good idea on how to represent this in a more natural way, and this is the table. So you can give it a header line and you can explain what those things mean. So. Uh, in the case of name and birthday, this is quite clear. So the name is the name and the birthday is the birthday. But why the hell is the city a number? Uh, because cities normally are like words, like Köln. So um, this is a topic called joints, which we will get to in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but first let's say, okay, we represent uh, those as tables because uh, we also like adopted that into our language. If we talk about our da database, we talk about tables and we drop tables and stuff like that. We even flip tables. So we have one problem and this is a huge disconnect. Um, we have a domain world and in this domain world, we say that Alice owns a spaceship, right? So um, this might be a diagram that someone draws that, that wants to explain to you what, this expl uh, what the domain is about. Like they would say like, here, this is Alice and this is a spaceship and they are, they are like connected to each other and we draw it with an arrow. And then there is this database person and says, ha, huh, of course, then I will have three tables. And every person that doesn't know anything about SQL will probably now be confused. Um, and this is the disconnect this talk is about. So, but let's first dive into this left side, into this domain side. So, Eric Evans sees six main types of domain objects. And the first one is an entity. And an entity has, is identified by an identity. So, it, yeah, it um, is something. So, it, uh, yeah, it, if you change something about it, it will still, still be the same thing. A good example for that is a person. So if a person gets married and changes, changes uh, his or her last name, then it will still be the same person, uh, at least in the database. Um, and therefore we have to make this state mutable. Um, and this is different for a value ob object because a value object is only identified by its value. So uh, for example, a street is a value object. A street has a street number and a, um, a house number, a street number, I think. Um, and if you change something about those two things, then they are not the same thing anymore. So they are immutable. As soon as you change it, it's not the same thing anymore. Uh, and this is quite important. Um, and then we have services. And services are things that do things. Uh, and they are just identified by what they do. So for example, a service that sends mail to people uh, would be identified by it sends mail to people. Um, and it's hopefully stateless. I see a lot of services that are not, but hopefully they are. So if you do the same thing twice with a service, it should produce the same output twice. Okay, and then there are three more. Uh, I will skip over them a little. Like we have factories. In Ruby we call them builders um, because Java probably, uh, but we still have them. So there's something that um, produces other domain objects. 
Then we have a repository. And a repository is basically a thing that stores other things. So you can imagine it as an, a big array, for example, you, where you can add things, remove things, search for things, uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, and the important thing is because we are talking about the domain, we are not talking about how this is implemented at all. We just say, like, you can put astronauts into this repository. How it is implemented is not relevant. Um, and in a lot of cases, it is implemented by, uh, uh, by being backed by a database. And then we have aggregates. And aggregates are a connection of a domain model plus one or more entities. So, for example, a person with the address they live in. Uh, and aggregates um, are, uh, yeah, give, um, no, no, no. <laughs> Eric Evans uh, uh, suggests us uh, to do something special with aggregates. And this is um, denormalization. And this is possible because those value objects you connect your object with are immutable. So you can copy them as ma many times as you want because uh, if one of them changes, you don't have to change all of them that have the same value because if some person moves to another, another house, then not all per people that live in this house change, uh, switch the houses too. Not necessarily, at least. So we can denormalize this stuff. And in SQL, this is kind of an anti-pattern um, and the reason for that is that we cannot put uh, the tuples into tuples in an SQL database. So the idea that some people had was let us, let's lift those restrictions. Let's say like, okay, now we can put tuples into tuples. Also, let's allow tuples with arbitrary attributes uh, where you can just say like, okay, this person has a name and this person doesn't have a name, which makes a lot of sense, um, I think, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so, um, in this world, um, we can now put our value objects into our domain mod, uh, objects. We can call this embedding. So if we have a space shuttle, and the space shuttle has some parts, uh, then we can just embed those parts in the space shuttle. Um, and if your database is able to do this kind of thing, then it is probably a document store. So this is one kind of a NoSQL database. Uh, so it's a place where you can, every document has its own structure, and the structure can even be nested. So in our example, we now would have three documents. We, had, we would have Alice and the space shuttle, and we would have a third mysterious document, uh, which has some two IDs in it, uh, which is like the join document, basically. Um, and this is again like, it's closer to what we explain to people because we don't have this, those mysterious tables going on, but we still have this problem of connecting to things. And we have to create something especially for uh, explaining what we, are, what we want to do here. Also joins, um, like I, I heard a lot of, uh, about joins in one talk today and I like, had a, like, like a flashback because in a past life, I did a lot of SQL joins. Uh, I did like uh, social network analysis at university. And I did a lot of joins, a lot of joins. Uh, and a lot of them were recursive joins. And if you don't know what that means, don't look it up. It, it's bad, don't do it. Um, so we had this long SQL queries in our code um, because yeah, we had, didn't have something cool like arrow. It was just like long strings, uh, like built together. Uh, and they had comments beneath them, and they were all like, I have no idea what's going on here, like every single one. Uh, so joins can get really bad really quick. Like in the beginning, they seem like really fluffy and nice, but as soon as they get bigger, they are kind of scary. Um, so there's a different way to uh, model relationships between things, and this is a graph. So we have Alice, and um, as the person that drew the domain before, we would draw like an arrow between those two things. There's an ownership between those things. So Alice owns the spaceship. This is the way we would draw that. And if you can do that kind of thing in your database, then it's probably a graph database. Uh, there are a lot of different definitions of graph databases. I don't want to get into those. Um, I think the, the most important thing is you have some way of storing graphs in your database and you have some way of naturally querying those graphs. Um, more is up to discussion, I guess. Um, so in this, uh, in this graph database, we could now 
express this, this error directly. So then there is this, we had, we had this um, space shuttle that um, had, consists of parts, uh, and we have this relationship. Now it would be nice if we could combine those two kinds of things. And um, the idea behind, uh, the, the idea on how to do that is simple. We just say that Alice and the space shuttle are both documents. And, um, and those, with, with those documents, we can do all those things that I described before, like embedding stuff. And the second trick is that the edges between them are also um, documents. So again, we can do all those things that I just talked about. So for example, if we would want to say that Alice owns the spaceship since 1978, for example, then we could put that into the edge because it's a natural way of expressing that. And if we want to know all outgoing edges uh, that, ha that have been there since 1978, we know which spaceships she owned from that period on. So if your database can do that, then it is a multi-model database. Um, it called, it's called like that because it combines two models of database into one database. Um, you could also combine different databases together, but most multi-model databases put those two things together. Maybe also a key value store, which I won't get into. Um, so I talked about this disconnect between the, the domain world and this world of tables. And I think that a lot of us, we don't see this disconnect anymore because we're really deep into this entire world of SQL statements and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but you have to think about that someone in your team has to translate between those worlds. And either this is your developer who does this in, in his or her, her head, but someone has to do the translation. And in a translation, always, it's always the case that uh, information gets lost. Um, so. I think it's important that we see this disconnect and be aware of it. And if in the case of a multi-model uh, database, this disconnect is much smaller because this is much closer to the thing that we could draw on our piece of paper when we talk to our domain expert or product owner or our customer because this is basically what they would draw if you would ask them, hey, could you like say that Alice owns this spaceship? Um, so the procedure I suggest is uh, first explain graphs to this person, like the domain expert or product owner, and say like, this is how you draw a graph. And this won't take long. Like I've done this multiple times and it's not a problem. I tried to explain joins and it did not succeed <laughs> so well. Um, so um, this is a very short task. And then there's a very long task, and this is learning about the domain. So you talk uh, with a domain expert and ask, uh, ask this person, um, yeah, what, what, is this, what is this problem about? Where, what words exist uh, in, this, in this world? And from that, you can then build a common language. And you can draw on a piece of paper the graphs that belong to this language and to this problem. And then you have a shared understanding. And this is extremely important because uh, now you build one model that everyone in the team understands. Like every single person in, the, uh, in, the, in your development group, in your, in your company, understands the same thing. And if you read the excellent book, The Design of Everyday Things, uh, this is also very cool because if a customer comes to this website you have built and all of you had the same model in their head, then this model will also reflect in your product and it will also get into the head of your customer. So it will be extremely nice for usability and user experience. So um, uh, one important thing, because it sounds like big design up front, um, you have to evolve this model. D don't just draw a piece of paper and this is like the absolute truth. Um, you have to evolve it. This is the reason why iterative development is one of the um, like basis of uh, this methodology. So thank you for uh, listening. Uh, I'm Moongloom on uh, GitHub and Moonbin Labs on Twitter. And um, if you want to check out a multimodal database, go to arangodb.org. Thank you. <laughs>